Nuclear regulators have begun evaluating safety measures at a spent nuclear fuel reprocessing plant in northern Japan. The plant's operator, Japan Nuclear Fuel Limited, applied for the check earlier this month. Nuclear Regulation Authority or NRA officials will investigate whether the plant in Rokasho Village conforms to new stringent safety guidelines adopted in December. An official from Japan Nuclear Fuel says it has raised its estimate of the scale of earthquakes that could hit the plant. The company uh, plans to install water pumps and spraying equipment to prevent hydrogen explosions. NRA Commissioner Toyoshi Fuketa says, unlike nuclear power plants, fuel reprocessing compounds house several types of facilities. He says they are all he says they all require different safeguards. Fuketa says the NRA will study the facility's characteristics to assess just how prepared it is for a serious accident. The company officials see the Rokasho plant as playing a key role in the country's nuclear fuel recycling policy. They hope to pass the screening in October. But it is unknown how long the assessment will take. Work on the project has already been postponed 21 times. Japan marks the 19th anniversary of the Great Hanshin Earthquake. The quake devastated the western port city of Kobe and surrounding areas. Various commemorative events are planned to remember the calamity. Over 6,000 people died. Survivors and victims' families lit bamboo lanterns at a park in Kobe, Hyogo Prefecture. They were formed to read 117. The numbers represent the date the earthquake struck in 1995. People offered silent prayers for the victims at 5.46 a.m., the exact time of the quake. Kobe citizens also laid out a set of lanterns to form 311, representing March 11, 2011. That day, a giant earthquake jolted eastern Japan. We need to understand this is not someone else's tragedy. I feel this is the best way to commemorate those who died. I'll never forget this disaster. Local authorities and residents are under pressure to prepare for another disaster. Seismologists are warning of a possible mega quake triggered along the Nankai Trough. Fukushima, an ongoing warning to the world. I'm Amy Goodman, host of Democracy Now! with my weekly Breaking the Sound Barrier podcast. This week, Dateline, Tokyo. I write these facts as dispassionately as I can in the hope that they will act as a warning to the world. So wrote the journalist Wilfred Burchett from Hiroshima. His story headlined The Atomic Plague appeared in the London Daily Express on September 5, 1945. Burchett violated the U.S. military blockade of Hiroshima and was the first Western journalist to visit that devastated city. He wrote, Hiroshima does not look like a bomb city. It looks as if a monster steamroller had passed over it and squashed it out of existence. Jump ahead 66 years to March 11, 2011, and 600 miles north to Fukushima and the Great East Japan earthquake, which caused the tsunami. 
As we now know, the initial onslaught that left 19,000 people dead or missing was just the beginning. What began as a natural disaster quickly cascaded into a man-made one, as system after system failed at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Three of the six reactors suffered meltdowns, releasing deadly radiation into the atmosphere and the ocean. Three years later, Japan is still reeling from the impact of the disaster. More than 340,000 people became nuclear refugees, forced to abandon their homes and livelihoods. Filmmaker Atsushi Funahashi directed the documentary Nuclear Nation, the Fukushima Refugee Story. In it, he follows refugees from the town of Futaba, where the Fukushima Daiichi plant is based, in the first year after the disaster. The government relocated them to an abandoned school near Tokyo where they live in cramped, shared common areas, many families to a room, and are provided three box lunches per day. I asked Funahashi what prospects these 1,400 people had. There's none. Pretty much the, the only thing the government is saying is that uh, at least six years from the accident, you cannot go back to your own, own town. The nuclear refugees were given permits to return home to collect personal items, but only for two hours. Like Wilfred Burchett, Funahashi had to violate the government's ban on travel to a nuclear-devastated area in order to catch the poignant moments of one family's return on film. He explained how the family gave him one of their four permits to take the trip. I tried to negotiate with the government and they didn't give me any permission to go inside there and any other uh, independent journalists or documentary filmmakers didn't get the permission to get, go inside. But uh, I got along uh, very well with this family uh, from Futaba and they gave me, okay, maybe we go back in there and then we got uh, four permits and then we are just using two, so why don't we come together? He snuck back with the family on their short trip. The Japanese government's refusal to grant Funahashi access is indicative of another significant problem that's emerged since the earthquake, secrecy. Japan's conservative prime minister, Shinzo Abe, enacted a controversial state secrecy law early last December. Here in Tokyo, Sophia University professor Koichi Nakano says of the new law, it, of course, concerns primarily uh, security issues and anti-terrorist measures, but uh, in the parliamentary exchange it became increasingly clear that uh, the interpretation of what actually constitutes state secret could be very arbitrary and rather freely defined by government, uh, government leaders. And, for example, anti-nuclear uh, citizen movements can come under surveillance without their knowledge and arrests can be made. Since the nuclear disaster, a forceful grassroots movement has grown to permanently decommission all of Japan's nuclear power plants. The prime minister at the time of the earthquake, Naoto Kan, explained how his position on nuclear power shifted. My position uh, before March 11, uh, 2011, was that as long as we make sure that, that the safety uh, uh, it, it's safely operated. Nuclear power plant can be operated and should be operated. However, after experiencing uh, the disaster of March 11th, I changed uh, my thinking 180 degrees completely. You know, we do have uh, accidents such as say, air, you know, air, airplane crash and so on, and sometimes hundreds of people die in an accident. But there is no other accident or disaster that would affect 50 million people, maybe a war, but there is no other um, accident can cause such a tragedy. The current prime minister, Shinzo Abe, leading the most conservative Japanese administration since World War II, wants to restart Japan's nuclear power plants despite overwhelming public opposition. Public protests outside Abe's official residence in Tokyo continue. The independent journalist Wilfred Burchett wrote, It gives you an empty feeling in the stomach to see such man-made devastation. He wrote those words sitting in the rubble of Hiroshima in 1945. The two U.S. atomic bomb attacks on the civilian populations of Hiroshima and Nagasaki have deeply impacted Japan to this day. Likewise, the triple-edged disaster of the earthquake, tsunami, and ongoing nuclear disaster will last for generations. 
The dangerous trajectory from nuclear weapons to nuclear power is now being challenged by a popular demand for peace and sustainability. It is a lesson for the rest of the world as well. I'm Amy Goodman with Dennis Moynihan in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, it's really been trying for years to turn the country into a major tourism nation. On Friday, the Japan Tourism Agency said the government achieved its goal of attracting 10 million foreign visitors a year for the first time in 2013. Agency officials said about 10,360,000 people visited Japan last year, more than 860,000 of them in December. They noted that easier visa requirements pushed up the number of visitors from Southeast Asia. The yen's decline also helped. Encouraged by the latest data, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe instructed relevant cabinet ministers to work out a new action plan. Japan has been given the opportunity to host the 2020 Olympics and Paralympics in Tokyo. This should help promote tourism. We'll try our best to achieve a new goal of 20 million visitors a year by that time. The government plans to improve access to downtown Tokyo from Narita Airport, put up more signs in foreign languages, and provide better internet The U.S. Connects. Navy has announced plans to boost its strength in the Pacific region. Navy officials say they'll replace the country's nuclear-powered aircraft carrier stationed near Tokyo with two other carriers. The USS George Washington is being sent back to a U.S. shipyard for an overhaul and to be refueled. The ship has been stationed at Yokosuka Naval Base since 2008. It's the U.S. Navy's first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier to be based overseas. It'll be replaced by the USS Ronald Reagan. The vessel is the second newest of the U.S. Navy's 10 nuclear-powered carriers. The Navy also plans to transfer the nuclear-powered carrier USS Theodore Roosevelt from the Atlantic to the Pacific. The Navy officials say they need to deploy the most capable warships in the Asia-Pacific region to maintain security. Analysts say the U.S. is trying to enhance its vigilance against China, which has stepped up its maritime activities. Well, good evening to you. I'm Abby Martin, and this is Breaking the Set. Well, here's a story that's true to keep you up at night. According to findings just released by the Air Force, 34 officers at Maelstrom Air Force Base in Montana were just caught cheating on a proficiency exam. All right, all right, all right. So cheating on a test isn't really that bad. I mean, we've all done it. Except I forgot to mention one small thing. Maelstrom houses ballistic missiles and the officers caught cheating were taking a test on nuclear launch procedures. But if that's not enough to make you want to cower under a table, don't worry, it gets worse. The whole reason this cheating scandal came to light in the first place is because the Air Force launched an investigation into drug use among officers at the base and discovered the cheating through their text messages. Isn't it nice to know that Rob Ford and Alex Rodriguez are apparently guarding the nation's nuclear arsenal? But at the very least, we know that the nuclear launch codes are extremely complicated and hard to crack, right? Actually, no. You see, according to Dr. Bruce Blair, former nuclear missile launch officer, up until 1977, the launch code to set off nukes was, wait for it, 0000000. 000 000 000. Yep, eight zeros in a row. But don't worry, I'm sure by now the Air Force has changed that code to 1234567 Now let's break the set.